So hello there and welcome to video number one in which we're going to be looking at adaptation. So if we're looking at adaptation, the first key question is, what is an adaptation? Well, an adaptation, so note the an there, an adaptation is any heritable trait that helps an organism such as a plant or an animal survive and reproduce in its environment. So this is a concept that spans many different scales of evolution. So that was the definition for an adaptation that I've put on this slide for you here. This is otherwise, or I suppose more specifically known as an adaptive trait. And it's a feature that is common in a population because it provides some form of improved function. Adaptations will normally reflect whatever that function is, and they are the result of natural selection. They can take a bewildering range of forms. And on this slide, I've put three examples of behaviors that allow better evasion of predators. So these examples on this particular slide, and I had a great many for, to choose from, I can assure you, are a praying mantis on the uh, left-hand side here, showing a thing called diamatic behavior. This is threatening or startling behavior to distract or scare predators. So again, if you distract your predator, less likely to be eaten, that gives you a fitness advantage. In the middle here, you can see an impala, um, and this impala is um, engaging in a behavior called stotting. This is jumping high with stiff legs and an arched back. And it shows, we think, the high level of fitness of this individual and tells predators that the, um, that individual is likely to be able to outrun the predator. So it's a, it's a tactic to make um, predators less likely to try and chase this impala. Uh, the third example on the far right hand side here is a thing called thanatosis, also the name of a metal band, FYI. And this is, a, this is a, just another word for playing dead. So if you play dead, you can avoid predation because um, many predators will go for living food. Similarly, there are um, some uh, species which use uh, thanatosis as a way to lure in for, um, their prey, so as a way of catching prey. Both of those are examples of adaptations, although towards different ends and purposes. There are also obvious physical adaptations that can help avoid predation, um, which include, uh, for example, uh, camouflage. You can see this in a bird on the left-hand side here, and we've got examples throughout the animal kingdom of this. There's also mimicry. You can see a leaf insect. This is an, actually an insect. It looks a lot like a leaf, but that's an insect, um, which is camouflaged by looking like the plant upon which it lives. Some animals, however, go the other way. And these, in this case, they become really, really obvious. It's a thing called aposematism. And this advertises to predator that they won't be nice to each. An example here is this fairly garishly colored, but super cool sea slug. Um, and of course, you have animals that are, we're probably familiar with in this country that mimic that signal as well. So you can see an example here of a hoverfly that looks like a wasp, because looking like a wasp means that things mistake it for a wasp, and that gives it a, um, that helps protect it, because wasps can sting, even though this creature can't. So all of these are examples of physical adaptations to help you avoid predation. Whereas in contrast, the last slide was behavioral adaptations to allow you to avoid predation. All, though, fantastic examples, I think, that's why I chose them, right, <laughs> of um, an adaptation. Some adaptations, of course, <clears throat> will occur at a molecular level. Um, so this is when, um, well, I suppose, ultimately, because DNA impacts on morphology, all adaptations occur at a molecular level. So bear that in mind, that was not a particularly accurate or well-formulated statement. But um, I was more thinking specifically with this statement that um, sometimes changes in DNA will directly modify proteins that will allow a better function in specific environments. So this isn't filtered so much through development um, as morphological changes would be. Obvious examples occur in the archaea, those single-celled organisms that make one of the two fundamental divisions in the tree of life um, that we met in the first lecture. 
So some archaea thrive at extremes of heat, cold, um, extreme uh, pHs, salinities, pressures, and radiation. And as such, there's loads of really cool evidence in this group for adaptations in the proteins that they create um, as part of their metabolis metabolism. Um, you can read about them in this paper here. Um, but I wanted to give you just a few examples. So examples in the group include thermophilic proteins, um, this includes those which are um, found in the bacteria that live in volcanic waters, such as Yellowstone, shown on the right here. And these proteins have the ability to retain their structure and function in extremes of temperature up to about 105 degrees Celsius, which is really quite impressive. There are also examples that we know from this group of piezophilic proteins. These are changes to proteins that allow them to function and thus for their organisms to live under extremely high hydrostatic pressures, so at great depths um, of rock or uh, of water, for example. There are um, proteins that work in uh, pHs as low as one. These are acid acidophilic proteins. Um, and they remain catalytically active down to low pHs. There are halophilic proteins. These are for organisms that like living in, um, in waters, for example, with high salt con concentrations. So salt has a significant effect on the solubility, stability, and conformation of a protein. So proteins in salty environments need to be especially formed. And there are a load more examples in the paper that I put here, if you're interested in reading about them. But I wanted to finish talking about physical adaptations, um, these adaptive traits, by giving you one example that shows you just how complex they can become and how cool they are. But I first wanted to put this warning um, that you may want to skip over the next slide if you don't like snakes or spiders. And you may want to skip over it if you really like birds. So the Consider that a fair warning, and you can just skip forward in the video if that doesn't sound like your bag. But this video is an example of how complex adaptations can get. And as you can see, you've just got a spider here, happily wandering around a rock. So happily wandering spider, all is good. Spider's now sitting still, wandering again, wandering again. Just a spider on a rock. Oh, nope, nope, turns out that was actually the tail of a snake. So this is a lure on the tail of a snake that looks like a spider. The snake waves it around and that attracts birds that predate spiders. But when they uh, try and pick up the tail, that allows this snake to attack that bird. This is a really good example of the complexities of adaptations that can build up over hundreds of millions of years of evolution. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't that cool? Obviously not for the bird. I mean, that kind of sucks for the bird, but you know, pretty neat, huh? So I think that's a really fantastic example of, uh, of the complexity of adaptations. So those are ad adaptations or adaptive traits, but adaptation is also the name for the process by which things become adapted. So Rob, had a section, uh, I think it was section 2.3, on the scale of evolution and how small things scale up to big ones. And he highlighted in that the random nature of genetic changes. So at the genetic level, when we're talking about DNA, um, changes are based on mutations, and those are primarily random. And he mentioned as part of that the theory of neutral evolution, or I, sorry, I should say the neutral theory of evolution. And this kind of posits that random or stochastic changes of genomes within a population are kind of like one of the primary factors, and that these random changes add variation. That's not part of the neutral theory, that's just a statement that this is where variation comes from. But the, uh, the neutral theory of evolution kind of maximizes or emphasizes the importance of these random changes. But we can contrast this idea of neutral evolution, the neutral theory of evolution, with that of adaptive evolution. Adaptive evolution happens when trait differences impact upon reproductive success. When that is the case, when the changes um, that occur um, within individuals um, impact on their fitness and thus their ability to reproduce, we have adaptive evolution.
We've also learned about fitness and selection. So that was um, part of Rob's lectures. And it's this that drives adaptation. So there's a, a, a definition of adaptation on this slide. It's any change in the structure or functioning of successive generations, so through time, of a population that makes that population better suited to environments. Natural selection of heritable adaptations ultimately leads to the development of new species and increasing adaptation of a species to a particular environment tends to diminish its ability to adapt to any sudden changes in the environment. That last bit I think is a nice addition but that isn't actually really um, part um, strictly of the uh, definition of adaptation but I left it in because I thought it was an interesting point. So in other words within a population um, changes may be stochastic so stochastic means random like this image on the left here those uh, green and black dots are all random that's a example of a stochastic image and in this case um, the changes are representing drift within the population but fitness and based on fitness um, we have selection can make adaptation um, which is a non-random process, arise from this random process. So my green and blacks on this image on the right from the matrix are no longer random. And that's fu fundamentally the difference between those two. We've got a random process, and this random process is always happening. Um, fitness and then selection uh, leads to adaptation, and that is fundamentally a non-random process. So in what circumstances we see neutral versus adaptive radiation, sorry, adaptive evolution, um, depends on many different things. Um, and indeed, on a small scale, um, the kind of the balance between neutral and adaptive evolution is the subject of lots and lots of ongoing research. There's loads of reading that you could do on this. But I think it's fair to summarize, based on the reading that I have done, that neutral forms of evolution, such as drift, such as mutations that, um, that uh, kind of are fundamentally random, has a bigger impact on smaller scales, so talking about DNA level changes or shorter time periods, than on bigger scales, so changes in morphology or over many generations of time. So I hope that's a useful insight into what an adaptation is, then into adaptation the process. And I want to finish by highlighting um, this on this slide that adaptation occurs through adaptive evolution. But given what we know, we should remember that not everything is an adaptation. I think for, for us as evolutionary biologists, if we consider ourselves such, um, it's very easy to assume everything is down to adaptation, but some things can just be the result of chance. Um, passed down because they have no effect on fitness. And furthermore, um, the heritable traits that we uh, have and we see in, in the world around us could be linked to another character that is being selected, selected for. So they may just be, they could even be slightly deleterious, but, not, but the, um, the trait with which they are associated is highly um, beneficial to an organism. Or um, we could be looking at adaptations towards previous environments. If the environment has changed, we could be looking at a situation where adaptations have not managed to keep track with the environment. So adaptation is important, but it's not the be-all and end-all of evolution. There are lots of things to consider. Basically, what I'm telling you is evolution is a complex topic. And I think by this point, you probably know that, right? That's what makes it so exciting and cool. Cool. So adaptations themselves can evolve and change through time in numerous ways. And I have chosen not to focus in on this too much for, for needs of really keeping this less than, a, less than a three or four hour lecture for you all. But a common and interesting process in the evolution of complex traits that I wanted to finish this video on is a thing called exaptation. So I've put this word here for you so you can see how it's spelled. And this is just a fancy word for a shift in the function of a trait. There are loads of really cool examples of this. Um, and a really neat one that I've chosen to, to highlight in this slide and to finish this video for you today is an example that's seen in the evolution from non-avian dinosaurs into birds. So the dinosaurs, these big lumbering creatures that were around in the um, Mesozoic, definitely evolved into birds. There's no question about that. 
Um, so, you know, all is good. But the latest research shows that a large range of feathers or feather-like morphologies, morphotypes we may call them, were present in the dinosaurs that were most closely related to birds. That's really interesting. This work suggests that they already fulfilled a really wide array of biological roles prior to the evolution of flight within this group. The, the posited roles for the early feathers include thermoregulation and visual display. And this all occurred, this evolution all occurred prior to their co-option for flight. So this is what you can see on this tree on the right hand side here that I took from this really interesting book that we can get free through as an ebook through our library if you want to learn more about this. I was super pleased to know it was available when I was writing this lecture. And here you can see um, the changing uh, morphologies of feathers that we see within the evolution of the dinosaurs on the way to the birds. And on this particular tree of the birds and their closest relatives, you can see a number of um, major changes within the feather morphology based on this phylogeny. Now, as Rob has already mentioned, a phylogeny is just a hypothesis, so bear in mind some elements of this tree may be wrong, but as this tree is drawn, what it suggests is that you start off with a filamentous morphology for feathers, you then start having a primary branching and a planar morphology um, slightly further up the tree. You then start getting secondary branching um, in this uh, clade called the Manor Manoraptora. And then you get a closed vein uh, once you get really close to the birds. And that's reflected in this the evolution from 1 to 11 across here. So it's really important to note that this is an exaptation because these things were not adapted for flight at first. Um, there were several aerodynamic innovations and flight-related morphological adaptations that were probably independently experimented with within the uh, clade that is most closely related to the origins of birds. But flight had nothing to do with the earliest evolution of these structures. They were exapted. They are an exaptation. Feathers are an exaptation. And I've put some examples, in case you don't believe me, because why would you, right? I'm a long head hippie talking about evolutionary biology. On the left-hand side here, you can see some examples of these, um, of these non-avian dinosaurs where they have preserved feathers. If you look along the back of this creature here and around the throat of this one here, you can clearly see um, the remnants of feathers in organisms that didn't have a forearm that was adapted to be a wing. So we know they couldn't fly. And that is a super cool example of an exaptation. And that brings me to the end of video number one. Hope it's been interesting, and I'll be back very shortly in video number two. Thank you for listening to me ramble.